Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining tonight's edition. This is your host Nino and in this episode we shall be having a look at an incredible hacker study of the 1980s, which really has two sides. One being the side of the German hackers, as represented in the movie 23, nichts ist so wie es scheint, like nothing is as it seems, and the other being of the US American astronomer Clifford Stoll of Berkeley, who traced their activities and in the end was responsible for their uncovering. Starting first with a little look at the movie, I would like to present you an incredible hacker movie, one of my three favorite ones, together with War Games and Sneakers, which is however barely known outside of the German-speaking countries, and as I'm pretty sure that most of you have never heard of it, I would also like to hear with very warmly recommend it to you. It is capturing the 1980s in Germany, just as very few other movies ever could. The technological excitement about the ability to connect to other computers over the first network, such as BTX and DateXP and an analog on to, to American Tim, Net, and so on and so forth. People were genuinely fascinated by the notion of being able to connect across the globe to another computer, something we nowadays take for granted, but which at the time was certainly causing a lot of pondering and fascination. Also, personal computers were starting to enter the public scene Hacker conferences were just starting to be organized. And, of course, the 1980s were a time of crisis, peril and risks, which was certainly also in the minds of the rebellious youth of the time, who, being adept at technology, was trying to somehow improve the world by more radical means. If you are a bit of a history buff, you will certainly be aware that the times of the German Red Army faction, the leftist militant student organization, which committed various terrorist acts, were not that long ago at the time, and the spirit of need to resist against unfair, possibly fascist, orders of society was still very much in the air, and the youth was, well, correspondingly having ideals, ideas of rebellion, upheaval, and change of the world. And this spirit of the 1980s, it is, which is certainly pervading the personality of the young hacker Karl Koch, alias Hagbard Selain, a young gentleman very much interested in computers and hacking, as well as being quite obsessed with the Illuminati and believing that secret societies stemming from them, being them, or being somehow related to them, were controlling current affairs, just as he is attributing a lot of influence to them in the past. So this man and his talents are, well, the central topic of the movie. And he starts with, you know, looking at the old documents of the Illuminati and the, you know, the things which, which could be found in, in the library above, about them. And over his interest in computers and, and the Illuminati, like here, this conspiracy theory that on the $1 note is depicted not George Washington, but Adam Weishaupt, like uh, um, the... the main person of the Illuminati, he's actually meeting fellow hacker David, with whom he is sharing these passions, and who is also interested in Karl Koch's theories about the influence of the Illuminati in the modern world, and the necessity to oppose them, where from he Karl Koch has picked his nickname of Hagbard, according to a fictional hero who is, well, fighting them. And for instance, the movie begins with the fact that Olof Palme was murdered 
at a point in time which is very much related to the numbers 2 and 3 or 23 and 5 also numbers being associated with the Illuminati and uh, two well boys or young men are actually quite obsessed with that and with the need to bring about some sort of change to the world and, and lead it to, to liberty and prosperity and outside of the control of, of dark and evil powers which are apparently still holding the iron grip about the lives of people. However, in their rebellious naivety, the two talented hackers quickly fall prey to two criminals who are mostly interested in raising some money to a rather hapless, if violent, gentleman, at least the guy on the right side. And these two guys very quickly note the talents of the hackers and make up a scheme to use their naivety and idealism for their own purposes, telling them that if you really want to fight against the unfair order of the world, against the unfair distribution of riches, you should be, well, essentially spying for the Soviet Union and uh, delivering American secrets to them. That, that's essentially their money-making scheme. They are also quite heavily involved in drugs, which they are using in order to render the two hacker kids compliant. So, these four form a somewhat unlikely team. And the criminals rather quickly decide that the way to make money would be, of course, to sell state secrets to and industrial secrets to the Soviet Union. The meeting with the KGB is <laughs> depicted as utterly grotesque and actually quite funny because they evidently don't know what they are doing. But in the end, they stumble through it and manage to reach an arrangement. Things in the beginning look good. The boys are picking up information from various sources, be they um, military or industrial sources, they collect that information. It is being delivered to the Soviets who are paying good money for it. And yeah, in the beginning things look good and the four of them are quite partying a lot and celebrating. However, things do not stay that way for a long time as the Soviets are asking specific targets to be attacked. They give them lists of things which they should be getting for them and more and more high profile requests are directed to the hackers who have to use more and more resources to try to obtain access to these systems which however with their limited equipment turns out to be no child's play and actually quite difficult or impossible and they are faced by technical challenges, crashes and so on and so forth. The nights become quite long. They are trying to briefly, briefly trying to improve their situation by getting a more powerful computer, which unfortunately ends up in the rain. How? Well, you will see when you watch the movie. That's, that's like the only gripe you can have with it. This is an AS400, they call it the PDP-11. It bears no resemblance to it, but if you do not pay too much attention to this, it actually works rather nicely for the dramatic effect. So they are back to square one, back to their, to their weak little machines, Ataris, Commodores, things like that. And the hackers are more and more paying attention to them and keeping an ever tighter control over them in order to fulfill their promises to the KGB. The hackers, in order to work long nights, are being placed under drugs by the criminals, like selling them essentially cocaine. So things really turn out that way, that whatever the Soviets are paying, the criminals are keeping everything because whatever share the hackers are getting from it, they are spending on the cocaine. And so, our main hero, Hagbard Selain, 
has to recognize that from the idealistic youth who wanted to change the world and to explore the networks of the time, he has more and more turned into a, well, tool for the Soviet Union to gain information for money, which is not exactly a very happy and positive thing. And yeah, well, their criminal friends show more and more their true colors. So it's not all fun and games. And of course, the other side, the Americans, are starting to figure out that something is amiss. And here you are seeing a very interesting still from the movie. Note that up there are lines about a document relating to SDI-Net, right? That sounds like, like, the, like some important initiative. However, this was actually a honeypot, which becomes clear if you read the book by Clifford Stoll on the events, and who makes clear that he actually invented a whole fake project with big enough files so as to keep the hackers online long enough downloading it and so that he might therefore facilitate a trace and gain their location because that was happening quite slowly due to the different systems involved and also the geographical separation and sometimes when when he saw the need of it Stoll was briefly short-circuiting the transmission line so that it would output garbage to the hackers though not outright demonstrating a connection failure which might get them suspicious so here you see such a like garbled screen effect caused by the american counterpart this is not mentioned in the movie but but it's actually rather nicely done and yes, Hack Barzelein, alias Karl Koch, does get suspicious enough about that. They do notice that they are now apparently under observation, in particular as some, some weird little transportation company on the other side of the street is keeping the lights up at night. And a call to this company where the one criminal was requesting to speak to the police really showed that he was being transmitted to this little room up there. So yes, indeed, the hackers were under observation, which got them more and more nervous and paranoid and raised the stress level and the risks for everybody. The Soviets, meanwhile, were requesting more and more high-profile targets, including nuclear power plants. And yes, you do see here Chernobyl. They do oblige delivering that information too. And shortly afterwards, the Chernobyl disaster occurs, which Karl Koch is attributing to his own actions and his participation in this spy espionage activity. And that really causes his total breakdown and, well, total paranoia. So, Things really come to their natural end and the hackers are being picked up by the German police, which of course does not go completely smoothly as, you know, when you're cooperating against your partners, they are not exactly taking that easy, easily and, well, if two of your partners are sort of violent criminals, that goes down even less nice. Karl Koch is shown here how... He met his end essentially one day he you know he was cooperative he, he found a little job at some place and one day he just got into his car never to be seen alive again and it is explained here in the epilogue that he did a business trip from which he did not return and one week later his charred body was found in a in a forest and the precise circumstances of his death remain unclear and he was 23 years old so there again you're having the 23 regarding the others well the thing was that what they were doing was not entirely harmless it was actually spying for the kgb against u.s american military installations and the like however the state authorities were not able to prove the specific damage undertaken 
and therefore the accomplices got rather light sentences. The two criminals were just getting probation and the other hacker, due to cooperating with the police, was let go and could cooperate with some news magazine in reporting about the KGB hack. All in all, the movie is very densely packed with 1980s atmosphere and technology such as acoustic couplers, ancient machines and laptops and all the atmosphere and technology of the time. This final screen which I'm showing you of this movie is by the way quite interesting. Let me zoom in. So this here is a program which the hackers wrote in order to capture real passwords. When someone was attempting to log in into the system, the system would first trigger this program which would ask for username and password, store username and password, and then say sorry try again. Most people would just assume that their keyboard was stuck or something and would not give it much thought and then they would be presented with a true login mask and really enter the system. However, this little thief would have captured their credentials. That program too is mentioned in the work of Clifford Stoll on the events. Not everything depicted is exactly as described, for instance, by, by Stoll. The names of um, the other protagonists were changed and it's also not true that the other hacker got nothing. He actually also got a probation um, judgment the way I was able to trace things at least. So maybe I'm in error, but yeah. So Stoll actually wrote two noteworthy accounts on that, though I have seen also some other descriptions. The one of them being contained in the communications of the ICM called Stalking the Wily Hacker. So if you would like to have a brief overview of the American side of events, that would be the thing to read. There he's really de de describing how over various systems the hackers were able to creep forward into further and further installations, really in the beginning trying, you know, common account names such as root guest system or field service and things like that. So this is the briefer and perhaps, you know, a bit drier account of affairs. What is however quite outstanding is his very entertaining book the Cuckoo's Egg, where he is describing in detail how events went from his perspective. The whole story starts actually quite ridiculously as he is trying to figure out a discrepancy of 75 cents worth of computer time which are not being paid by anyone. And then he figures out in the end that these are being generated by a user who does not have an associated institution that is taking responsibility for his payments. Asking around the system administrators, he comes to the conclusion that apparently nobody of them has created that user, which leads to him understanding that he is really dealing with an intrusion. He does figure out that apparently there is a version of GNU Emacs installed on his system that is having a security vulnerability and that essentially allows privilege escalation. Eh? What is the superior editor now? Huh? <laughs> what essentially he then does to catch the hacker or hackers is that he equips the machine which is being invaded over a particular connection with a man in the middle attack if you so will. Basically he connects printers which are printing out everything 
which is going through this infested communications channel through which the hacker is entering the machine. So once the hacker act enters the Berkeley machine, the astronomer, Dr. Stoll, is able to see whatever he is doing from this machine onwards. And if he uses it to creep forwards to other systems, he sees that too. The hacker is quite confident that nobody is observing him. So he's act acting actually rather methodically and I must say in difference to the movie, seeking quite systematically for, well, military secrets. Like it's, it does not look like such an ide idealistic youth as was painted partly by the movie 23, nor as someone quite so hapless but it looks like rather someone quite determined to get U.S. state secrets. And so he's showing you also in the book printout of some of the interactions like here for a VAX VMS system, which is having such an 80s flair. Also when he's talking about, you know, IBM and the time sharing option on their mainframes and so on and so forth. And so he's, you see here how he is looking for SDI and Stealth and SAC and so on and so forth. And he is also wondering how exactly the hacker is getting the passwords. And there are two main value, venues he's doing. The one thing being that he uses indeed exactly that login mask program which you saw on the screen on the computer of 23 where the user is being asked for a login then he's being told that he mistyped and the login is being corrected collected the other thing which the hackers have been doing is that they have been downloading the hashed passwords they have been downloading the etc password file and he understands that while they cannot decrypt the passwords back, they can nonetheless generate from dictionary attacks hashes that match the entries contained and thereby guess passwords. As of apparently at the time people were just sometimes using dictionary wor words as their passwords, that worked and was allowing another password collection scheme. And yeah, essentially that's the way he, well, ends the hacking operation by using his man in the middle attack as well as fake files to keep the hackers long enough online until the trace is completed in order to let the authorities capture the perpetrators. And here too, the book notes how, well, Hagbert met his end. So, that's really it. That's the end of this little adventure. I hope you did enjoy this video. Give it a thumbs up if you did and subscribe if you haven't yet. See you soon. And from me, in the 23rd minute, goodbye.